All right, so I'm pleased to introduce Noni Bell and Phil Rice from the University of Delaware presenting on Win-Win, Student-Generated Materials, Increase Engagement and Adaptability. So with that, I will turn it over to Noni and Phil. Okay, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as I was saying to Tabitha earlier, I, I applaud Watisaw for taking the initiative to set up these webinars. I think it's a, a great idea since most of us are working online at this point. Um, so let's get started. Okay, so um, we thought we would start. Uh, my name is Phil Rice. Uh, again, pleasure to be here. Um, what I wanted to do was start us out with the kind of activity that we would uh, use to get students engaged and motivated to produce their own uh, materials with with things. This this kind of thing is very simple, but I'm going to put a link in the chat, and um, I'm going to ask everyone to kind of go through what we might do in an activity like this. And you may use activities like this as well, but this is just one small example. So um, you should get a Padlet link and hopefully everyone's will work um, without any issues. And then I'll go through how I would probably do this with students. And I'm gonna stop your sharing Moni for just a moment. And I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So if you were able to get to the Padlet, um, basically what we wanna do is encourage students to use materials that are familiar to them and that they uh, enjoy, that are motivating. So with this kind of thing, instead of just telling them to write some sentences uh, somewhere or like on a, on a document or something, we're gonna make it more of a, a product that they can show friends, everyone can see. So the, the idea here is to describe your last international, it doesn't need to be international, but any trip um, using three past tense verbs. And then what you want to do is add a picture. So you want to click on that corner, corner, um, and some of you may be great with, with Padlet. Um, and we're asking everyone to add a picture if you can. And add, use three past tense verbs. So it could be international or not, it, it's fine either way. And if you, uh, if you need help, whoops, it's, uh, it's updating a little bit. If you need help adding a picture, all you need to do when you create is you look, you can search for say Ireland or Tanzania or something like that. So um, when you click that, it will bring up the search bar for images and you can put a cool image in there as well. So this is kind of a mini application of what we want to show you or the, the um, kind of disposition of creating student generated materials and using them for teaching purposes and for relevance and all of that. So we just thought might as well go ahead and get us right in with an example. <clears throat> Oh, that's great. Tanzania is beautiful. I've never been to Zanzibar. And wonderful. So normally, uh, what I might do if I were doing this, I would probably even connect it even more to the students and say, if you have a picture of your own from your family, but of course, in this limited time setting, we're not going to um, necessarily ask anyone to do that but but that's another way to expand the activity to make it more relevant and more motivating for students so this would just be a quick example of how to use student generated materials for motivation oh wow and someone turned their uh uh changed the color in ireland they changed the background color that's really awesome and then there's some room for creativity there of course and uh in, in Jordan, someone went to Jordan, Ireland, and Tanzania. Well, wonderful. Well, we look forward to the time when we can take these trips again. Uh, we know that that's not possible now, but um, this also helps to, to kind of get that positive feeling of thinking about, you know, when we can travel again. So this would be just one quick example. Now, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, everyone, for contributing here to making these quick materials, but these could be used in the future as examples. And this is the idea that we really want to promote today is, 
is uh, promoting motivation, but also giving us materials to uh, use as models to use as examples as well. So no, with that, I'll go to know. Okay, so to give you a little bit of background, um, research background, <laughs> um, Sherry Block from Concordia University um, made some comments about sharing students' writing samples. Um, so Phil gave you an example that included writing on a sentential level, um, but she talks about how sharing students' writing samples creates a classroom community. That idea of not just, oh, I look at pictures of your travel experience, but I find out about what you think, what your opinions are, what your background is. It, raise, it raises awareness for the students of audience and purpose for writing, which is something that often Often students lack in a classroom setting. They feel like they're only writing for a course grade or for the teachers. Um, but when they have a chance to write for their classmates, they get that sense of audience. So it empowers quiet learners, people who usually don't think that anyone will pay attention to them. And it allows students to experiment with new vocabulary, grammar, and ideas. In 2018, Dr. Chip Baumgartner from Pennsylvania College of Technology made some extensive um, research and comments on the benefits of using uh, student-generated materials for students, educators, and institutions. So he, he noted, similar to what Sherry Block had, that for students, they gained a sense of ownership that they became more interested in giving and receiving peer feedback, that in, it enhanced their written and oral skills as they talked about how to use the language. And it also enabled the instructional program to have low cost materials, um, which is often a great consideration for the students. For the educators, Baumgartner found that there was an ease of adaptability and updates to the materials. They didn't have to wait for an external publisher to update something, or you know, they could adjust it to their particular group of students. It also meant that they could avoid irrelevant or outdated material because the students were generating the material. And they could link the materials directly to course outcomes, which sometimes when you're using pre-published materials, sometimes you're having to sort of pick and choose. Um, but when students are generating the materials, then you can easily connect to your course outcomes. For institutions, zero cost on materials because the students are developing the materials. It also means that the institution can, can pull together current and very specific data about their uh, customer base, their student base. And, and it does re result in improved course outcome assessment because you can assess designing your assessments, you can assess specifically for what you've um, been teaching. Hmm? So, uh, slide, hello. Okay, so when we've used this at University of Delaware, we've seen, um, we've used it in a variety of ways. We've had students create their own dialogues. We've had them contribute written products to an anthology that we publish annually. And we've also had students create artwork or sample exercises to use with their peers. Additionally, um, we've had students perform original drama or video productions. In each of these cases, we've seen observable increases in students' sense of autonomy, their enthusiasm, and their confidence in using the language. It spurs group creativity, initiative, and respect for other people's contributions. So what can students do? What can they create materials for? They can create materials that you can use for instruction. They can create materials for practice. They can create materials for assessment. So if that's the case, what makes good quality student-generated tasks or materials? So Phil, I'll turn that over to you. No problem. So this will animate, yeah, there we go. So uh, good student-generated materials, we thought it'd be a good idea to give you kind of maybe a, a, you know, a mental rubric of 
you know, what, what makes a good student generated material. So the first point we have here is to create an audience other than just the teacher. So many times when students hand in essays or materials, they feel like the, only the teacher is ever going to see this. And that may be um, okay for some students, but some students may need more motivation uh, than that, or might be more motivated if they know that peers will also see it and, and so on. It will also engage other students. Good student generated materials usually have some uh engagement with other students in the process or the product meaning uh other students will see this or other other students will participate in creating that it will also connect meaningfully to students own experiences or interests of course we know the um sometimes the difficulty with pre-published materials is that students will say uh either this is outdated or it doesn't relate to me or it's culturally uh not sensitive to my culture so on it allows for some choice in autonomy or creativity. So a good student generated material will say, um, you know, maybe here's a few choices, choose from one of these, a, a, a few different ways to do this assignment. Or it may say um, something like, you know, uh, here's some different ways that you could uh, create a product or here's some different ways that you could work together as a group. It also could, and, and not always, but many times, will draw upon some other skills in English, such as art, videos, or photos, because many of our students have resources other than just their language skills. And then finally, and most important, we have to demonstrate the understanding of the concept. So if we get all the way to the end and a student makes an amazing video, but it doesn't use any of the grammar, uh, that means we've kind of, uh, or doesn't use any of the target uh, meet any of the target outcomes, then we probably have not uh, created a good student generated material uh, or an assignment that involves that. So we have four areas which are listening, speaking, reading, and writing that we're going to talk about the next few moments about uh, win winning. So, listening, one example. Let's see if that, I think if. Yeah, so there are uh, one example, a very simple example would be a drawing and listening exercise. So listening to someone and drawing. Uh, one really good way to do this is with Nearpod. If anybody uses Nearpod, uh, you can have students uh, listen and make drawings. So if you don't mind, uh, if I can put that in the chat, if anybody's interested, uh, I won't put the link, but I'll put the name of the actual uh, site is Nearpod. And what I've done is had students do prepositions uh, where I'll say the cat is on the table, the cat is under the table, the, cat, uh, the lamp is next to the table, and then they draw it. So this would be, uh, this would be motivating to them and it's also fun. And uh, that's one way. The next way um, that I've done this as well is to have uh, student generated materials is students generate discussion questions from short films. So, um, what I will do is I'll give students a practice where they create uh, a practice with a film where we do it all together, a short film, three to five minutes. And then instead of me giving them a bunch of questions, which I found, honestly, many times my questions that I would give them were not always relevant or not always bringing out the, uh, the kind of nuances of thought that I was hoping for. So what I, what I did was I basically taught them how to create questions to spur discussion. So that's another way to do that. And uh, using like narrative short films. And then finally maps, I think Noni's going to talk about that one. So something I've done with my low level students, low intermediate students is practicing the kinds of language that they need for asking directions or giving directions. And um, this is in an IEP program that, you know, it goes along with our course outcomes, but it certainly is relevant to adult education programs too. Um, but anyway, the whole practical thing of the structure of the language that you need in order to ask questions, to get information, clarification, and, and to be able to report back and to act on um, instructions. So what I ask my students to do is to draw a map of their neighborhood in their hometown. So it's a place that their other classmates haven't seen, 
Um, and then they have to practice using the direction of giving, uh, the language of giving directions, like uh, using this map. And they usually have a lot of fun with it. Um, and obviously you can, you can do it as these examples are done on paper, where the students drawn with their own hand, their neighborhood. Um, but it also can be done online when I've done it in my Zoom classroom where the students can upload a photo of a map that they've drawn, or they can even upload Google Maps or whatever to show their neighborhood. Um, but the idea is that then we use the language with the maps. So you can either do a listening exercise, as Phil is saying, where they're drawing something from what they're hearing, or in this case, they draw something and then they have to speak about it and their classmates are listening and demonstrating understanding by showing, oh, that's the place on the map that you took me to. Um, so anyway, that works out um, pretty well in terms of students generating the materials. Yeah, so another area that we like to see student generated materials is in speaking. And this is where we can have some fun. And actually, I'm gonna show you some examples quickly. Um, so speaking, uh, I have taught a film class and I've also taught a intermediate class. Um, the film class is very advanced. So these students usually uh, in English, they're very competent, um, but they're still refining some skills and they also learning how to use uh, photography, videography in this class. And so what we want to do is um, give them an opportunity to show that. So at the end of the sessions, usually we would have like a, uh, usually a drama and film production at the end of our sessions where all the students would come and watch. Now I'm gonna show you a short clip. This is a 30 second clip. They were asked for 30 to 45 seconds. They were asked to make a commercial. So um, they were asked to make a commercial and we showed this commercial to the student body. So if anyone remembers the direct TV, TV commercials, where it was like a slippery slope, when one thing happens, another thing happens, and then it keeps going until it's some kind of ridiculous situation, use that as a model. And this is what the students came up with when it comes to speaking English. So give me just a moment and I will, um, I will bring that up for everyone. Okay, so, and please let me know if you can't hear or anything like that. So can everyone see that? And I'll make sure I am sharing sound and I'll make sure I'm optimized as well. Okay, all right. Tabitha, is that good? Can everyone see that? We can see it, yep. All right, excellent. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a sample of what students made. Here we go. When you don't speak English, you cannot understand the map. What? When you cannot understand the map, you get lost. When you get lost, your car runs out of gas. When your car runs out of gas, you get stuck in a rural area. When you stay in a rural area, you work on a farm. <laughs> when you work on a farm, you get run over by horses. Don't get run over by horses. Speak English. <laughs> okay. That's right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, let me see. I'll stop my sharing. So that was that was a, a simple thing, uh, it, but it, it really took them a lot of time to produce that um, and. Also, what, what, what I did was that became one of my models for the next classes because they did a really good job of, of using the forms that I was asking for and using the uh, dependent clauses when you don't speak English, this happens, when, you know, and so on. So the idea was it had the target grammar, but it was also funny and engaging and motivating and the students had a lot of fun. Uh, there, there's one more example that I'll give for a radio commercial, and this one had to do with using emotion and intonation. And sometimes I found that I would ask students for recordings, and um, they would read something, and it would be kind of mm, blah, uh, not as exciting. So I said, well, 
instead of um, just asking for a recording, let, let us turn it into a commercial uh, instead. And so I will share that as well. And yes. Uh, okay, sorry. So, and And this one was uh, one of the main points of this was to get students to share with emotion and use intonation. So hopefully um, this will be nice and I'll, I'll raise up the volume a little bit. Can everyone hear that? Okay, all right. Oh my gosh, Terry's Brad Pitt, unbelievable. Where is my camera? Oops, it's gone. Where is my cell phone? Oh, it's gone too. I lost my lucky chance to take picture with Brad. Don't go, Brad. Don't go. <laughs> Don't worry about situations like that. You can make energy for your devices and charge them whenever and wherever you are with the energy factory by just moving. If you purchase the energy factory right now, we're gonna offer a special price and gift. Don't hesitate to get it. Make energy by yourself. Okay, all right. So just some 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 cute examples for everyone, um, and just to show that uh, also what this did for me as a teacher when I would find that students would excel at this, it became an excellent teaching tool for the next group that I had. So um, I just wanted to give some examples and then what we'll do is go back to, to Noni. So the third example on this slide, can everybody see the slide again for speaking? Is that? You yep, still, we see it. Still, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, anyway, the, oh, now I clicked. Too far. Um, so the third example there is called Conversation Champions. This is an activity that myself and one of my teaching assistants at the time developed. And I've continued using it for probably about, I don't know, close to 10 years now. It just works so excellently. So in a listening speaking class, the students learn a lot of target vocabulary and learn how to try to use it in conversations. We have a variety of sample conversations from textbook materials um, and listening, listening to conversations and all of that. We arrive at a point where it's like, okay, folks, you need to create your own conversations. So this activity basically gives them an example conversation. And I use examples from students uh, who have created something in previous um, academic periods. And we give them a topic and then the target language. So what we work on are in, in this lower intermediate level is phrasal verbs. So they have to have a certain number of phrasal verbs in the conversation. They have to have transition words. They have to explain a process, et cetera. And we give them an example. We go through an info gap activity where there are uh, two different, people are listening and identifying um, some of the phrasal verbs in the conversation and what they're used for. And then they have to work together with the partner that, that they're paired with to fill in the blanks in the conversation. They have the sample conversation in front of them and then they have to create their own conversation. Now, the part of this activity that is the most terrific <laughs> is that they spend probably 45 minutes to an hour talking about how to use the vocabulary and how to do the language function of explaining a process together. They're, they're talking in English with a partner and they're creating a conversation in English and they're getting an awful lot of language practice for the mileage. When they finish the, the creating their conversations, they record them, and then I have materials that can be used with future courses. Um, so that has been a win-win um, for a long time now, and um, it just works very well. With one of the things that Phil mentioned was about listening um, and uh, drawing. In this case, these are samples of students' drawings. You can see the student on the 
uh, whose drawing is on the left was a much more skilled artist um, than the guy on the right. But regardless, um, they were representing a character from a book that we were reading together in reading class. And, and some of you may be familiar with this book. I don't know. It's called The Ring. Um, and it's, um, oh, the name of the author just went on in my head. But anyway, it's a book that is adapted. Uh, it's written for ESL readers. Um, Bernard Smith, that's it. Bernard Smith is the author, a British ESL teacher. And he, he just has wonderful descriptions in the book. And it really lends itself to students reading and trying to show their comprehension by drawing what they've read, what they've seen in the text. I mentioned before the student anthology. Um, so every year, we, we our Language Institute creates a magazine with students writing. And, and this is like a, a really nice piece. Uh, it, it's, um, you know, it's a magazine. It looks really nice. Maybe whatever program you're in doesn't have the funds to do that. But you certainly can do something that is photocopied and made available to students. And one of the things that I like to do with my students in reading class is to go and pick sample writings from peers of theirs and analyze them. Take a look at, well, how did this person um, make their topic statement? How did they support the topic statement? So we can, we can look at some of those kinds of examples. We can also look at, you know, did they use um, compound complex sentences? Or, you know, so we can use students' writing to go over grammar points, to go over um, writing process. Um, and, and you can also use the content involved. It may be, you know, it's a, a persuasive argument or it's a research paper and on a topic, you know, whatever. You can use the content or the structure of it or whatever. So it's that's been very rich to be able to use students' writing um, as examples for instruction. So in, in writing, we have brochures and Phil's going to give us some examples of those. You can keep clicking, Noni. I think it'll bring up the okay. other. Um, so one, a couple of ways that I've used uh, writing for the material, uh, student generated materials. So uh, one quick way, if you could keep clicking through would be brochures. And this is honestly, you know, it's easier in person, but um, if we see, uh, we have a couple here, and basically I was teaching students how to use um, modals of necessity, you have to, you need to, you must, uh, so on, you've got to. And so uh, I basically told them, you need to make like a brochure of a how to, pro like a how to manual. And instead of just writing down sentences on a piece of paper and handing them to me, my more artistic students were able to, as you can see, that was, these were probably the best ones uh, that I had. Uh, and then I continue to use them as examples. So you can see those in there. There's a little testimonial here from students about how they enjoyed making the brochures and posters using the grammar I learned. And so this is actually from a student who made it. Um, I chose the topic which was familiar to me. Thus, I'm able to learn how to use the grammar model and try to use the grammar. Just writing sentences is boring for some students. However, drawing pictures in the writing activity keeps every student motivated high. Uh, we were absorbed in making brochures. Also, these activities were memorable for me. So the grammar which I used in the activities are easy to remember. And that's probably the most important to me is that they're learning that uh, grammar and being able to use it and, and remembering it. I think the samples you showed us before the writing activities started were always great and cute. These samples made us try to create work better. So this is the benefit of having other students create things before and using previous materials to be kind of the motivators for the new students because then they reach to an even higher level. Uh, we can keep going there. And then uh, I had students make a kind of, um, another take on this was uh, a process and then they made a uh, like a, a web presentation, a PPT. Instead of just writing down a list of modal verbs, they made a process. So they went through, you have to go through the website idea and you can just click through that, Noni. I think it'll be four or five. Yeah, so you, as you can see here, the student did a good job. You can keep going. All right, and then we got to this one where past, present, future. Normally, uh, I might, in the past, I might have said, you know, let's write uh, three sentences in the past, three sentences in the present, three sentences in the future, and write them down on a sheet and hand them to me. But by making this more of a process, 
and a product, I found that students were much more motivated and excited to go through and create these materials. And um, then again, I could use them for the next classes. There's another one here. And you can see, see they, uh, again, we're, we're very motivated to do that. So we can continue. Um, and lastly, like what we did with um, what we did with Padlet here, and and I have I've had them use a, an app called Fonto on their phone, but there's other apps that could be used. Basically, students would choose a picture from their phone specifically, and then what they did was use those photos to create sentences. So instead of again, hey, just write ten modal sentences, I said pick ten photos and then put captions with the photos. Okay. And um, you can keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this just explains what I said. Yep. Okay. So the results of that were students created complete sentences. They were motivated and they expanded vocab. So, uh, so what this did was it really motivated them, and they used their own photos. So keep. Uh, we can go to the next one, Moni. Noni, I think you're you're up. Mm -hmm. So tips for implementing this. Um, Obviously, we've mentioned about modeling. You can create your own example for the first time, or you can use exemplary student models um, after you've done the first assignment. One of the things that we've seen is you often have to adjust your expectations, and it's not always adjusting them down. Sometimes you see that students do much better than you anticipated um, with an assignment, um, but you also have to understand that the first time they don't really get it necessarily and so you have you have to adjust your own instructions to them you know when you provide examples it becomes a lot clearer uh, so student produced models will stimulate the learner's interest in assigned tasks we've seen that that individuals demonstrate progress toward their linguistic goals and increased awareness of the learning process so many times my students will say i want to become like a native speaker but they have no idea how to get there. And these kinds of activities help them to see some of the process um, in getting there. Uh, they're also likely to produce materials that are relevant to their peers. So these are all good outcomes. Imitating their peers encourages them to a higher standard. Students are empowered to impact the classroom instruction when they feel like, oh my gosh, I. I'm interested in this, so this is what we're talking about in class. This is what we're doing in class. It really makes them feel powerful. So the question we have for you is, what can your students do? We've given you some examples of things that our students have done. What can your students do? So we're gonna give you a little task here, put you in a breakout room, uh, ask you to create a modal verb assessment that requires students to create their own materials. So you want it to be an assessment, you want it to be with modal verbs, but you can use whatever modal verbs you want. You can use whatever kind of assessment, listening, speaking, reading, writing, it's up to you. Um, we'll give you 10 minutes to work on that, um, to design an assessment, and then um, we're gonna ask you to explain it to explain your assessment, okay? So um, Tabitha, can we have you put, um, put us into a breakout room? All right, rooms are open, so everybody should see their invitation. From your breakout room. I just wanted to clarify, because Angie, we were in the middle of talking about her idea, so. Uh -huh. So there's one Google slide and each breakout room is contributing to that same slide. You're muted. Sorry. It's not even a breakout room. It's um, I have now have the ability to push one slide per student. So each student gets to populate their own slide. Uh, sorry. And I finally remembered Noni's other idea was imagine that you are training somebody to do your job. So that was another sort of a, a, a way to create a slide based on that. So there's the I can, can you, um, different, you should, right? You should, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, things like that. Yeah. yeah. So really nice. So we actually, 
we we kicked off so many ideas it was it was hard to come to just boil it down to one right right well that that's a good thing that's a good yeah and then you also you had the idea nani also of um assessment student yes. assessment using these slides as student assessment right the first time you do it with something like slides it's technology they're not going to get it it's going to be a disaster so the first time i ever tried this i said what's your favorite color and you have no idea how they screwed that up <laughs> no idea um. oh my somebody took a photograph of their slide and put it on telegram and then sent me photographs of their handwritten answers in summer i like this color like, oh my god just answer the question orange <laughs> orange so the first time you do it i would not yeah. recommend it being the project i would do no. a no skin in the game activity yeah. like, yes that's exactly that's your, right yeah that's exactly right so yeah so let's um let's go back to our um, slideshow where, okay, I wanna advance here. So you've just talked about your assessments and, and so you've seen a whole bunch of different sample activities um, that we've presented and you've talked about some in your groups. And now we'd like to give you a chance to ask any questions or make comments if you have any. Um, you can do it through Zoom chat or there's so few of us, I guess we can just do it, um, you know, with live questions. And then we have an exit ticket that we want to ask you to complete. Um, so did anybody have any questions or? Well, I just want to say in response to the first prompt there, I thought that the stu I was so inspired by the student anthology. I love that idea that students are kind of publishing and sharing their work and then generating reading texts for each other. Yeah. Well, it, and that's an interesting thing, Tabitha, because with many of my students, and as I've mentioned, I, I'm mostly teaching lower intermediate students. When I see somebody whose writing is good, <clears throat> I'll invite them to contribute to the anthology. And many times they're just like, me? Are you kidding? You know, and, and they're so excited. And, and one of the things I say to them is that this is something you can put on a university application that your writing was published in the ELI anthology. And, and all of a sudden they just think like I've given them the world, mm -hmm. um, you know, and basically, you know, what they've written in most cases is a paragraph or two, two to three paragraphs, you know, but there was something engaging about what they wrote. And, and so there's something very much um, confidence building about this. You know, I had this one student who said, I have to tell my parents about this. They'll never <laughs> believe it. <laughs> yeah, it's That's fun. Cute. Yeah, very cute. I had a question about the conversation champions activity mm -hmm. that you talked mm -hmm. about. Yes. So. Uh, after the students have created their own conversations that has this target language and they've recorded it, what what happens next? What do the students, the other students, do with that? Um, usually, the the way I do it, you could do it in a lot of different ways, but they they record their conversation and right. they also give me a transcript. I ask them to provide me with the script. I give them a grade. And they get, they get a two-part grade. The grade is based on their, what I call their partnership, their collaboration, how well they work together. If one person did the lion's share of the work, then the other person doesn't get as good of a grade on that portion of it. But then they, get, they also get a grade for the product. Did it meet the requirements? I give them a rubric and they know what they have to have in the product. Um, but so they get a grade and very specific feedback on on their conversation, but then I use the products in future classes. So their class doesn't necessarily get to see it again or hear it again. Although there have been times when we used it as a contest and they, um, and I've, I've sort of morphed the activity and I haven't done this recently, but in the past they would perform their conversations for their classmates and their classmates would vote on which one was the best which one had met the standards um, 
you know, the most accurately. And part of the reason I got away from doing that um, was because I ran out of time in terms of it takes a lot of time for each of the students to perform their conversations again and then the group to vote on it. But also that many of our students who are from group oriented cultures um, and, and we would have blocks of them, they would vote for their friends. It's not because contest. They're, they're, yeah, yeah, you know. So then it was like, okay, well, we're not gonna do that anymore. But I do use their conversations as examples and I have actually used some of them in assessments. So I'll take the recording and the transcript and I'll ask the students later for an assessment to identify what are the phrasal verbs in this conversation? What are the modal verbs in this conversation? The things that they were supposed to include in it. And so for an assessment, they have to identify them in, in a different student's product. And so that works well too. I mean, there's many uses you can do with this stuff once you have it. Okay, thanks. Sure. If there are no other questions, um, we'll give you an exit ticket. And and Phil, are you putting that link in the chat, or how are we doing that? Yeah, I'm doing. Um, it'll just take me a moment here. Okay. I want to make sure I have the right one, and I don't give you the wrong thing. Um, Phil, while you're doing that, can I ask if um, what LMS uh, you guys are using? I mean, I don't have any. Canvas. You have Canvas. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Canvas is the standard at UD. We don't have like, uh, in the previous years before we adopted Canvas, teachers were using all different kinds of things, school Giamoto, uh, whatever. And honestly, that could be kind of tough. Definitely yeah. on students because yeah. students didn't have any continuity between classes. They'd have to learn a whole new LMS every session, every eight weeks, which was not very uh, efficient or- That's or what we're helpful. facing ourselves right yeah. now. You know, the idea that I get them in, uh, in the door in level 100 and I'm teaching yeah. them technology that I'm familiar with and that, yeah, exactly. that they're getting a handle on. And then they go to another teacher who doesn't use any technology at all. And yeah. they feel, wait, I got cheated. I don't know whether the first teacher cheated me by making yeah. her all of this or whether <laughs> this one is letting me down. It's like, ah. And then they well, go to somebody who uses a totally different system. So we're, yeah, we're experiencing that pain at the moment. Yeah, this is more, I'd say it's more important now than ever to have a streamlined, like a, like a uniform system to use, even if it's Edmodo or some kind of free thing, as long as it's, you know, that. So, um, so I'm just sharing the exit ticket. If you could share some feedback, the name is optional. You don't have to share, um, but it's just basically to give us some information about the session. And um, we just appreciate any feedback you have. And, sure. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's all. All right, well, thank you so much, Noni and Phil, for your presentation and for bearing with our technical difficulties. Uh, so this will and be- And you with ours. Oh, uh, uh, we ha everybody has to be patient now. That's right. So um, yeah. thanks everybody for attending the um, second- Last this question, the Watchy I, I, webinar. I, I swear, are you going to, will you make this um, webinar available? It will be video? available on YouTube. It'll be on the Watchy Cell YouTube channel within about a week or so. So thank you, everybody. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you, Tabitha. Okay, thanks, Tabitha.